Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India The decline of the Roman Empire created an increasing political void across Europe. Usually what would happen when a big emperor falls? Take a guess in India for instance, assume you have a big emperor who rules across the subcontinent and then he falls the emperor dies or becomes weak, what would happen then to the political order of the subcontinent? You take a, you take a guess and tell me what it would be. be uh, there will be a lot of uh, fighting within the empire uh, for his successor, who would be his successor. That is one thing. There will be a lot of clash amongst the uh, other kings of uh, the other states and maybe there will be a constant state of confusion. Because they will not be fighting themselves. In short, what you are saying is at the fall of a great empire, the inevitable consequence would be some kind of political chaos. Hmm? Quite true. But the fall of Roman Empire did not happen overnight in one shot, it happened very gradually. The outer edges of the empire started falling first because they were the least manageable. And at the outer edges of the Roman Empire, in fact, I would suggest do not write, just listen, I will tell you when to write. At the outer edges of, edges of the empire, you found increasingly autonomous people taking over power, sometimes in revolt against the empire or sometimes quietly paying the due obligation to the empire. But a substantially autonomous rule of their own. So, this sort of thing was happening as the empire was declining. It was not a sudden chaos, but as the empire declined, 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 these ones which were, which were on the fringe, they started getting more and more powerful. I will give you an example of what happened in South India, not because it has it anything to do with the Roman empire, but the process was similar. You see, when Aurangzeb fell, the Mughal Empire was an incredibly powerful monolith, but when he fell, all the mansabdars who were running the provinces became more autonomous. And as the mansabdars themselves became weak, their subordinates in sub provinces became autonomous. For example, in 1700, a person became very prominent in northern Tamil Nadu called the Nawab of Arkat. Arkat is a place that is which is some 60 kilometers from here. It still has a fort of that Nawab. More importantly, in Triplican, the descendants of the Nawab are still living in reasonable comfort. But what is important is around 1700, the Nawab declared himself independent of the Nizam of Hyderabad who himself was a representative of the emperor in Delhi. So, Delhi became weak after Aurangzeb successfully, I mean successively it became weak and the Nizam and others like for instance, the, the rulers of Bengal, they became autonomous. The rulers of northwestern province became autonomous, they all became increasingly autonomous, but the Nizam became autonomous too, but the Nizam himself became weak over a period of time, partly because he did not have to worry much about Delhi. So, he started living it up. So, then he got weaker, then people below him like the man who declared, declared himself the Nawab of Arkat, all those guys became strong. So, when an empire breaks up, it may not immediately lead to the rise of chaos, it may simply lead to the rise of a vast number of regionalized 
localized power structures. Am I right? This is what happened when the Roman Empire fell. Now write. So, all these outlying marginal seats of power started growing as the empire became weaker and weaker. And there grew up people who used models of power, models of authority which came from their tradition, not from the Roman tradition. They did not have bureaucratic rule, they did not have Roman laws, they did not have Roman judiciary, they did not have the legionaries fighting, but they had their own models. In most cases, these models followed a practice which came to be known across Europe as feudalism. What is feudalism? Take a guess, Ashwati. You are modeling it after the Janmis of Kerala. Well, Janmis of Kerala were not actually feudal, they were more autocratic. Well, Krishna. Like there were people who are hold, having land holdings and they employed other people to uh, work on, this was a part of feudalism, to uh, work on their land holdings. So basically landlords had servants working on their farm? Something like that. Mm. Do you know what happened? Aditi, well you do not have feudalism in Mumbai, what can I do? Do you have any idea Avantika? What my idea of feudalism is similar to what Krishna said about feudal lords uh, having uh, uh, peasants working uh, under them. And, uh, but who are feudal lords? And that's what uh, I am asking. Uh, uh, who are uh, um, repre uh, not representatives of the king, but uh, who um, Keep had talking. their authority vested in them by uh, mm. ruling leader. Yes and no, but I have I've got what I needed from you, which is a cue to move forward. The heart of the word or the heart of the feudal system lies in this world, in this word fief. Have you heard of fief? Fief dum, what is that? Lovely hierarchy, right. Basically, fief is a bond of loyalties in a hierarchical system of power. Do not write yet, you have got to get used to not writing. 
So, fiefdom, fief is a bond of loyalty across different tiers of hierarchy, which bound the hierarchy together, which held the whole system together. I am giving you an example, which is not a specific example of anywhere in Europe or in Japan, but essentially what might be typically illustrative. There is a man who has a chieftainship of a particular area, say about 100 kilometers, square kilometers is the extent of the area he controls from say some town like Akkat, right. I am just using Indian names, so that you know it will be familiar instead of my saying Hamburg or Luxembourg or something. No? So, so you have the chief of Arkat and the chief of Arkat under him has maybe a bunch of fellows called Talukdars. Each of them has smaller parcels of each of them has authority over smaller parcels of land, may be called a taluk, right. And each fellow has a taluk which is his domain, his territory. And the Arkad's chieftainship not only covers all these talukdars who are under him, but the Arkad chief himself is a talukdar who is bigger than all of them. So, he has a relationship with these talukdars. When the Arkad chief goes to fight, these talukdars will have to provide certain number of men to fight, certain number of horses and certain resources, certain amount of grain, certain amount of gold, whatever is it takes to fight a war. So, that is their obligation. In return, it is the job of the chief to make sure that this talukdar is not harassed by any other taluk, that his autonomy, his sovereignty is protected. So, it is an interlocking power hierarchy. The power of the chief in Arkad derives from the power of the talukdars in their areas. And in turn, the chief of Arkad guarantees this the further sustenance of the power of the talukdars in their taluk. This is one level. Then the talukdars under them may be have a bunch of fellows in every taluk, maybe they are called zamindars. I am just using names at random. Maybe a taluk has 10 zamindaris or 5 zamindaris. These are smaller fellows than talukdars smaller territories, maybe one fifth of a taluk or one tenth of a taluk or whatever, but underneath each of them, there are a bunch of fellows who work on the land. The early forms of this relationship, these fellows are all tied to land in the sense that, if that zamindar sells off his land that land goes with these workers, right or better still those workers cannot be sold like slaves. They are locked with the land, they are with the land. These fellows at the bottom, the tillers of the soil at the moment, let us call them that, they have a little parcel of land for their own, which will sustain them, but in order to have the privilege of having that parcel of land which will sustain them, they have to work the lands of the zamindar. If I have two acres of my own land and if I have two acres which I can till which is my own, then I will have to till five acres which belong to the zamindar. So, I sustain the relationship between me and him through this bondage, the bondage of labor. And if the zamindar sells the whole zamindari, then all the serfs in that place get transferred to the new owner, right. This relationship with the tiller to the immediate boss, which we call zamindar here in Europe, this person used to be called the lord of the manor, right. And the system used to be known as the manorial system. 
and more importantly the relationship was called serfdom. Hmm? Start writing. Incidentally, you boys, the rules of the game are: you just listen to me, and when I say when I say write, you start writing, and then when I start speaking again, you listen. Okay. There is plenty of material available on the web on feudalism, different types of feudalism. So, it might be good if you just googled just to see how many variations and what kind of patterns there were and how things changed in feudalism from one time to another in the same place. Okay. All right now, let us put it all together. On the one hand, you have the lord of a particular area terrain province, province under whom there are maybe sub lords, under whom there might be lords of the manor and the manor house being the physical center as it were of the feudal system at the ground level. There is a, there is a manor house or the manorial house around which are the lands of the manorial house, which are tilled and worked on by the peasants who live around that area either in villages or in groups or alone, it varies. And these peasants are locked to the land, the, the lord of the manor in two ways. On the one hand, they get the freedom to cultivate a certain portion of the land which is given to them to enjoy in return for cultivating the rest of the land which is the lord's land. Two, they get recruited to fight for the lord when he needs to fight and in return their personal security and safety from every kind of bandit, every kind of nuisance is guaranteed by the lord. So, you have an interlocking obligation systems from the top right up to the surf 
right this interlocked system of mutual obligations which sustain which bonded the whole system together very nicely went right on to the top where there was a monarch one of the one of the big chiefs was a monarch and he held other big chiefs under him in a feudal relationship he had a fief relationship with those people eventually when the monarch went to war everybody went to war how because each one passed on the word eventually the manor lord of the manor would get the word saying okay look i want 50 men with 50 lathis and two spears and three swords send them over under one leader okay said so that's how the army was collected that's how the system was sustained and how the economy for sustaining the people and the army came about right this is the feudal system you want to write this down all right you can see what a contrast this is to the empire of rome with its bureaucracy with its overarching legal system with its very powerful army of fighting soldiers across the place and sustaining its borders sustaining its revenue collection sustaining the building of roads and infrastructure making connectivity across the empire it was very hard to hold that system together but feudalism had the advantage of not having any of those you know structures but it just held itself together because everybody looked after everybody else so feudalism came to replace vast territories of europe as the next authority system after roman empire and feudalism grew feudalism expanded and along with this also came stagnation because if you guarantee security if you guarantee everything then how do you extract what you need to extract from somebody right so there is always a potential of a tension across the hierarchy in feudalism hmm? two there is a certain part of the country which didn't come under any of these feudal feudal tires of hierarchy and obligations those were the parts of the country which were towns all this is fine lord of the manor the territory the serfs and then the chief it's all rural so the big aristocrats of the rural area and the serfs at the bottom this is they are linked together through a chain of hierarchical connections but the towns had none of this the towns were were all towns were all were there to support the merchants the traders the artisans in 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 other words the whole manufacturing sector of the economy was in the towns they were not regulated by this feudal hierarchy the towns were independent the towns the organization of the towns was through the organization of guilds hmm what are guilds art form or manif sector or whatever nice say that again society is specific to one particular art form or particular trade trade yeah okay the, the guild of blacksmiths the yeah. guild of carpenters the guild and so forth right in other words it was a 
a trade organization or a professional organization built based on a particular business, particular professional, particular craft, particular trade, particular manufacturing process, whatever. But it consisted of all the people who did this, who practiced this particular form of craft or manufacture or business or whatever and they subscribed funds to the guild which looked after their interests. So, the guild looked after the for instance it looked after the employment of all its members. It protected made sure that they, they got regular employment. One way in which it protected their employment is to make sure others did not come for those jobs there. So, if you had a weavers guild in a particular town, it made sure that external weavers from outside that town did not come into that town, it kept those fellows out. So, they would say go back to your own guild. So, just as the feudal hierarchy protected the interests of different rural areas, the guilds protected the interests of their particular groups of businessmen traders concerned or artisans concerned. And the organization the, of the political structure of the towns was usually a collection of the leadership of the guilds. They constituted the leaders of the town in various forms. So, across Europe you had great rural hinterlands where the aristocracy ruled the serfs. And you had these rich prosperous pockets in towns where manufacturing activity went on lot of trading activity went on, business prospered, people were shipping things to overseas, exporting goods, importing goods. That was the other center, which was completely autonomous of the aristocracy. So, you can see that if these traders and merchants and artisans wanted to transport their goods from one town to another, they had to go through the hinterland of the aristocrats rules, the, the feudal interior and that is where they got taxed. They would say okay, you are passing through my territory, you have to pay so much tax. Then 10 miles further down the other fellow will say you paid him, you pay me now. In other words, the force which governed feudalism was a force of extraction of feudal dues, sometimes taxes, which was hostile and in contradiction to the force that governed the towns, which was growth, prosperity and manufacture. So, eventually there are two elements of contradiction that grew up in feudal Europe. One in the country it was the serf versus the lord, the aristocracy versus the serf and in the territory as a whole the contradiction between the town and country. The town was completely different in every sense of the word to the country. And the country did not like the autonomy of the town because you know it is a threat to the country and the and the town did not like the imposing extractive behavior of the country. So, feudal contradictions developed both in the country and between the country and town as time passed. You want to write this down? Okay. The church had its own role in all these things. We saw for instance, the church as an organization had come into the fore into its modern form by the 6th century AD. 
it was a huge process of gradual consolidation, bishops, bishops got together, bishop of the sea, bishop of that sea, sea being S E E, you know that is the territory of a bishop. So, gradually cardinals, archdukes and eventually they all got together in what is called the college of Rome and elected a pope. So, the pope became the titular and, and religious leader of the whole of Christendom by the 6th century this had come into existence. Now, so the church connects people from the smallest villages, smallest hamlets, from the tiniest slum in a town to God. It is a mediator between man and God, it is it's an immense organization. Again many layered, many tired, you had the pope, you had the cardinals, you had archdukes, you had dukes, then you had bishops, right, you had archbishops, you had bishops and then you had the parish priest who was dealing with the Christian flock. So, you had a matching hierarchy to the feudal hierarchy in the church in the religious world and both needed sustenance, not just the feudal aristocracy needed sustenance, the church needed to sustain itself. It had to employ all these people, it had to look after itself and gradually therefore, the churches started building assets. By the 15th century, the different churches under the rule of Rome, different bishops, archbishops, all these people together constituting the church made the largest landholders in Europe, more than all the kings, all the dukes, all the aristocrats. By the, by the end of the 15th century or 16th century came in, the church was the major rival as an economic power to the whole feudal aristocracy headed by the monarch. And the church also found its way of trying to extract things from that from the town. However, saying that the church was an economic rival to the aristocracy is only saying one part of it. The power of aristocracy grew by the use of the church by use of religion and for this the church extracted its penny. How does this happen? How did religion come into play in the bond across the feudal hierarchy? Let us look at that, but before you might like to write this down. Right. Let us understand how the church acquired its power and how this power was utilized by the aristocracy. See the church as an organization is an intermediary between man and God. It is a whole organization without which man cannot relate to God. A good child or a good Christian had to be baptized as a child. If you are not baptized, you are not blessed, you are not graced. 
you will go to hell. So, beginning with the baptizement ritual and eventually you are being interred in the churchyard, you are being buried there is a continuous series of reward punishment tie ups between you and the divine force. For example, if you are not a good Christian, your child might not be baptized and who says you are not a good Christian, which means the local parish priest must be happy with you as a good Christian, which means you are making a regular contributions to the parish, you do things that and so forth. In short, you should please the parish priest, you should please the bishop and so forth. And the parish priest must have a good report about you to the bishop. It is a, it's a superbly interlinked and powerful network of information that you it developed over a time. Secondly, if you are not a good Christian, then you will not be buried in the churchyard. You know what the Christian belief about life after death is? Why are people buried? Do you know that? People are buried because they await the day of judgment. You are supposed to be there under the ground and one day the Lord will call you on the day of judgment, you will rise and go to the Lord and account for all the sins that you have committed and all the good deeds you have committed and eventually the Lord will say, okay, it is heaven for you, go. Then on the day of the judgment, you might go to heaven or worse still on the day of the judgment the Lord will say you have been so nasty such a horrible sinner you should be roasted alive in hell go and then you go. So, the soul either goes to heaven or hell as per the verdict of the Lord in the day of the judgment. So, you wait in the churchyard under the ground for your soul to be seeking its own salvation that is Christian theology and you do not get entitled to any of this process if you are not baptized in the beginning, if you are not dipped in the holy waters, anointed with the holy waters and told you are a Christian, you are blessed by the Lord, then you are a Christian. Otherwise, you do not get benefit of any of these and then you do not get married as per the rituals of the church, so that you can reproduce more Christians. So, you can see that from birth till death, your the fate of your soul hangs entirely in the hands of the church. This was the power of the church. As a result, the church could have a reign of fear across the population. And therefore, there were two sources of fear there were two sources of exploitation in rural Europe in the middle ages. One was the aristocrat and his hierarchy of people eventually extracting their bit from the serf and the other the church extracting its bit from the serf again, because the soul of the serf has to be salvaged. So, it was a parallel process of extraction and at the higher level they cooperated. The church leadership lived truly aristocratic lives, the bishops and archbishops and our cardinals, they lived immensely rich opulent lives and they shared lifestyles with the aristocracy. The big difference was the members of the church did not marry, whereas the aristocrats married. Otherwise, there were two parallel regimes, one administering to the spirit of the Christian and administering uh, the other administering to the physical security of the Christian. So, you can see how the church and the feudal aristocracy grew hand in hand. Would you like to write this down?
just as the guilds and the feudal aristocrats held their territory through very powerful repressive measures, the church also held its own through a very powerful repressive measure. So, the church could punish you for heresy, which means if you did not smile at the parish priest that morning, you could be punished for witchcraft, both of which was death. More importantly, you could be ostracized. What happens when you are ostracized? You are a nobody, you are nothing, you are removed from the community of other Christians, which means you are all alone, you are out in the wilderness like a dog wandering in the forest, you do not survive for very long. So, ostracization and physical punishment were common aspects of the rule of the church. And specifically the confessional was a very major instrument through which the church acquired knowledge of the very intimate personal lives of people. You are first told that you are a sinner, you are born out of sin and going to you are going to sin all your life, only the Lord can save you. So, you keep watching yourself and report to the Lord if you are committing sins, so that the Lord may forgive you and tell you how to make amends. So, invariably you go to the confessional and sit outside that little cubicle and kneel down and tell the priest, father I have a confession to make and father says yes son or daughter as the case may be. Then you start speaking whatever you think the bad deed that you have done for the day or for the week or for the month or whatever and then you say father I have to be forgiven. And the father says, well say 108 Ave Marias and then you will be forgiven. So, you say 108 Ave Marias which is like some slokam. You say that and then you are forgiven. So, what happens? The priest knows everything that goes on in your life. So, you see incredible power of control over the minds with a very powerful organization which goes right down to the bottom and which therefore can collect. The roots of European fascism which came in the 20th century go to the development of the church. Now, you can see why. The growth of church as an organization led, I mean was diabolical in the way in which it reached out and captured the minds of the people. But this diabolical reaching out was also partly in favor of the aristocracy. So, you need you did not need a Roman empire with its formal laws and judiciary and army, you just had this incredibly complex network down the hierarchy, everybody is looking over everybody else's shoulders. It is a very stagnant, non growing, non changing universe which can go ad infinitum, right. So, this was why Europe in that period was known as dark ages, medieval Europe was known as dark ages because it was, a, it was almost as if the whole of Europe was frozen in time with nothing moving, nothing happening till the 13th, 14th century. You want to write this down? So, let us sum it up. We have in this two sessions travelled a huge distance 
we have travelled a huge distance initially a 200 year period which was the period of great rise and then fall of the Greek civilization. And then how some of the cities on mainland Italy which were Greek cities started growing on their own independently and from there on grew the great civilization centered around Rome the most powerful of those cities called the Roman civilization. A lot of the antecedents for the growth of Roman civilization lay in what they learned as Greeks and then they built on their own a big language, a big culture, a powerful army, a tremendous administrative machinery, a powerful judiciary. Most of European law, most of law in most European countries goes back to Roman law, even the terminology is Latin. So, a very powerful culture civilization grew around Rome and there was a continuous problem in Rome of its internal contradictions. The very size becomes its manageability problem and secondly as more and more members of Roman bureaucracy and Roman army come from outlying distant tribes and groups the ability to manage them into a loyal manageable single whole becomes more and more challenging. So, eventually internally there is a crumbling force in the Roman empire, externally they are constantly under attack by the barbarians and eventually Rome crumbles and eventually the Roman empire crumbles. But part of this business of growth of Roman empire is the growth of Christianity Initially Christianity is full of martyrs, Christian martyrs suffered for 2, 300 years under Roman rule in Rome, but eventually the moment the Roman emperor became a Christian, then Roman empire became a Christian empire. So by the 6th century Christianity had grown beyond the Roman empire which had by then crashed into its own power and this time in collusion with the new political and social order which grew up in Europe feudalism. So, feudalism and the church hand in hand grew prospered till about 12th 13th century. And the contradictions in feudalism one in the country between the serf and the aristocracy and between town and country on the other hand. So, there are these internal contradictions which are ripening through time and then there is also the problem of the problem with the church. The church is growing stronger and stronger and stronger and at some point the king as a temporal head is often challenged by the pope as the religious head. So, the problem grows between two big economic superpowers of Europe the church and the king by the 15th century this contradiction reaches great maturity. In the 16th century the first of the breakdowns of the relationship between king and church happened. Henry the eighth the second of the Stuart kings of England decided to cut himself off from Rome for various reasons we would not discuss the reasons now, but he simply declared from now on I Henry the eighth is the head of the church. This is not the church of the pope in Rome, this is the church of England. So, the Anglican church was born with the English crown as its head and that was the summation of all these years of movement. Okay, then we are done. Do you have any questions? No. Is this method now Doing better, are you able to write better, think better, understand better? So, shall we sustain this? No? You prefer writing? No, well, we will have to reach some uniform decision on this. When when I get back, we will sort of look at this. Maybe, maybe we will do some kind of a compromise on this. Be that as it may, well, I will what shall I say? I will wish you good luck and Godspeed till I see you again on the 1st of September. I will be back in town on the 27th of September uh, August, but I will be in your class on the 1st of September. Look after yourself, you have my email ID. I have sent you 
those things and so you have my email id anytime you want to ask me something and so forth it's fine now meanwhile you can learn a lot by googling about the church the history of the church and so and so forth there's plenty of material on that hmm? see what you can pick up and then uh, swain has plenty of material on all this feudalism and the dark ages which i'm talking about and the growth of church there are at least two lovely chapters in that so you got enough material going there all right good luck enjoy it